And then um, I'm going to pray. Um, today we are talking about the Sixth Commandment. Um, the Sixth Commandment is, who knows it? Uh, I don't know. Anyone? Yeah. I don't remember what it is. Do we need to do some review? Let's do some review. What's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods. What's the second commandment? Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What's the third commandment? Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Please raise your hand when you're answering. The fourth commandment, what's that? Honor your father and mother. What's the fifth commandment that Pastor Howard talked about the last time? Yeah. Do not murder. you got to love it when your senior pastor talks about not murdering people. Good. And then the sixth commandment is? Yeah, see. Do not commit adultery. The seventh, anyone know it? I know we're not there yet. Not you shall not steal. Then we have the eighth. Yeah. False testimony. Ninth and tenth is both about what? Yeah. Coveting. All right, it's okay that some of you guys were cheating on that. Um, <laughs> it's just being resourceful, right? All right. So. Today we're talking about the Sixth Commandment. We're talking about not committing adultery, which means we're going to be talking about a lot of things that might be awkward or embarrassing or hard for you guys to talk about. Guys, especially seventh grade boys, I need you listening. So when we talk about this topic, I want you to know that I'm not necessarily super comfortable with it either. I might feel awkward about talking about this too, but we're in this together. And God's word talks about it, so we're going to talk about it. Um, but let's begin with prayer. I need everyone to close their Bibles because we're not there yet. Put it on your table. Be undistracted in this moment right now because we're going to pray to God. Uh, dear God, um, thank you so much for the sunshine, for this great day that you've given us, and for this chance to be here and to learn more about you and who you say we are. God, as we study the Sixth Commandment, we know that it can get awkward, it can get embarrassing, um, but you honestly have such an amazing plan for marriage and sex and it's important that we learn about this and what your word has to say um so be with us as we learn about this and help us to know your will for our lives in your name i pray amen, amen. all right so i can already tell there's too many side conversations going on for tonight this is too important of a topic for side conversations to be going on. So I need you guys to stay zeroed in and focused, okay? So the Ten Commandments, God's law in general, what is it for? Why do we care about what God has to say? Why do we care about the Ten Commandments? Well, the first thing is that God's commandments are for God's glory and for our good. What does that mean? That means that every single one of these commandments, including the Sixth Commandment, is to put God on display to point unbelievers to Christ, to make us stand out, to be set apart from the world, to be holy, to glorify God, and for our good. If we live our lives according to these commandments, there are blessings attached. God knows the better way. It's the devil that tries to trick us into easy and fun options that eventually lead to destruction and death. So the what is best for us is to follow these commandments. Um, it's for us, not from us. So that's a, something I'm stealing from Pastor Howard. He says this all the time, that God's laws, God's commandments are something that is for us. It is for our good. It's not something he wants from us. God doesn't need your obedience in these areas. What he does, why he has these commandments in the first place, is to protect you, to bring you abundant life. It is for your good that these rules exist. It's the same reason why your parents have certain rules. It protects you, it gives you guidance, and they want what is best for you. Even if you don't always like those rules, they are what's best. Because our God is a good father. And so we, we need to take that seriously. So that's the Ten Commandments in general. So the Sixth Commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Let's just get like the basics over with right away. So we're going to read the what does this mean part together. Ready? Go. We should fear and love God so that we lead a sexually pure and decent life in what we say and do. And husband and wife love and honor each other. This commandment is the one that I feel like is most under attack in our world today. 
today. Um, there are not many places that are teaching this message. So that's why I think it's so important that we as a church and as a youth group, we talk about these things. Because if you aren't talking about it here, I know it's getting talked about other places. So we need to know what God says about it. So there's a couple of definitions about this that I think is really, really, really important. The first one is what is marriage? We have to define what marriage is in order to even talk about this commandment. Marriage is, was created by God as the lifelong union of a man and woman for their mutual health and joy and for the procreation and nurturing of children. A man and a woman entering into marriage by the public promise to live faithfully together until death. Okay, so that's like the, the really technical definition, but it's true. God created marriage to be between a man and a woman, and he created it to be a lifelong union. So there's a lot of different ways that we as human beings have gone outside of this commandment of what marriage even is. What I think is really, really important here, guys, is that God was the one that created marriage. So he gets to define it. Because he created it, he gets to define it. We don't get to define it. So it's not what we want it to be. It's what God says it is, because he created it. We're gonna see that in a little bit. Then what is adultery? So we're saying do not commit adultery, but what is that? Adultery is the unfaithfulness of a spouse who engages in or desires sexual intercourse with someone to whom he or she is not married, okay? So adultery has two kind of components. It has a mental component and it has a physical component. We kind of always think of adultery as a physical component. It's a spouse that doesn't keep their promise to be faithful to their husband or wife, okay? But it also has a mental component of lustful thoughts and desires. And here's the thing, you can cheat on your spouse before you're even married to them. This is what this commandment says. This is why this commandment also includes sex outside of marriage. Because you will eventually, most of us, it's actually 85% of people will get married. So most of us will have a spouse at some point. So any kind of physical sexual activity out, uh, outside of marriage means that you're not participating in that with your spouse. So that is committing adultery. That's why this commandment isn't just for married people. Okay, It's just not. Okay, so we're going to go to a couple of these really important things with what this commandment forbids, what it would have us do. But before we do that, I want to tell you how tonight's going to go in a little more general terms. So I'm going to be giving you guys this big overview of the Sixth Commandment, what it means, why it's important to even you guys that are not married, and then we're actually gonna have a chance where you get to play a little stump the DCE. So I'm gonna give you guys no cards and you guys are gonna be able to ask your questions. So as I'm going through this preliminary intro stuff, I want you guys to be thinking of any questions you might have um, about this commandment, about what I am saying, okay? Because I know that a lot of you guys might have a lot of questions about this and maybe you don't have a ton of questions right now and that's okay too. But we'll give everyone a note card, and you can choose what you write on it. It will be completely anonymous, and we're just going to put it in a put it in a box, and no one will know that you wrote that question. Okay? So I want you to be thinking about that as we go through the rest of this teaching. Okay? What your question is going to be, and if you think of something, feel free to write it down on your binder so you can remember it when it gets to the next card. Okay? All right. So what does this commandment forbid? Um, it forbids all of these things. You guys have probably already started reading. Um, and it would have us do all these things. So I'm not going to go through all of them because you guys can read. But in general, it forbids divorce, except in the case of marital unfaithfulness. So marital unfaithfulness can look a few different ways. It can be someone breaking that covenant of marriage in a physical way. It can be, um, it can be, uh, sorry, a dissert a dissertation, which basically means they desert the husband or wife, and it can also be for abuse. So those would be the three biblical reasons for divorce. Besides that, God does not say that divorce is part of his plan for us. Um, it obviously forbids sexual intercourse between unmarried people, um, and includes a bunch of sexual sins and sexually impure thoughts and desires. So we're not only talking about actions here. 
a lot of times people that are able to remain pure and holy in their actions, they get really self-righteous. They say, man, I'm good at this. Like, I'm pure, I'm holy. But then they think all these impure thoughts. But God calls us to be holy in both our actions and our thoughts. So what would it have us do? It would have us consider sexuality to be a good gift of God, to honor marriage as God's institution, to reserve sexual intercourse for the marriage partner alone, and to avoid all temptations to sexual sin, to be clean in what we think and say, and to use our sexuality in ways pleasing to him. Okay, so that's a lot, right? That covers a lot of ground just right there of all those things that God wants us to do and would not have us do. And again, this is for his glory and for our good, okay? That's what we have to remember with all of these commandments. So the thing I think is really, really important is that this commandment is an identity and a value question. It really comes down to your identity and your value. The first thing is that you are a whole person. You have your physical body, you have mental, emotional, social, and spiritual sides to you. And the world likes to say one of two things. They're either going to go in the direction of sex is not that important, it's not that big of a deal, you can be casual about sex because it's just your body, right? It's just a physical act and it doesn't mean anything. So that's one way that society kind of tries to sell it, okay? which is not what God says at all. God values sex, he values marriage, he values families. So saying that it's just your body, it doesn't matter, it's all casual is one way the world goes. And then in the same time, society also tells us that your sexual identity and sexual acts and everything like that is everything. It defines your whole identity, which is also not true. Do you guys see how both of those are contradictory but they're both in society all over the place? It means nothing, it's just physical, and yet it's your entire identity. And neither of those are what God's word says. God says you are a whole person. You have all these different parts of you, and every single part of you matters. That your physical and sexual nature is not the only part of you. It's just one part of how God has created you. And this is the really important part, your identity comes from outside of yourself. You don't determine your own identity. You also don't determine your own value or your own worth. Who determines your identity, your value, and your worth? You. <laughs> so your identity comes from outside of yourself. If you, it's okay, because that's honestly a huge misunderstanding that's out there right now, is that you get to determine who you are. You get to determine your own identity. Your identity is outside of you. God has claimed you as his own. God says, you are loved. You are valuable. And you are his child. Your identity has been placed upon you in the waters of baptism. You are worthy, so worthy and so valuable that Jesus Christ thought you were worth his life. And not only you, but every single person you date with or interact with, virtually or in person, is someone that is valued and loved by God so much that he was willing to die for that person. This is, these are, we are all his children, right? Every single person that you interact with has been created by God. So they have worth, they have value, they have dignity. They have purpose because God has placed that worth and value and purpose on them. So their identity comes from outside of themselves. When your identity comes from you, when you get to determine who you are, if you have a terrible self-esteem or if you think you're worth nothing, then you're right. But that's not what God says. God says, I put your value and worth on you. Because I created you, you are valued, you are loved. And that is why God gets to care about our sexual ethic. God gets to care about the way we treat our bodies because ultimately they were bought by him with Jesus' blood. That's why this matters so, so much. I want you to guys look at Hebrews 13, 4. You don't have to look it up in your Bibles. It says, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. But 
Hebrews 13, 4. So it says, let marriage be held in high honor. Okay? Is marriage between a man and a woman held in high regard today? Why or why not? I want you guys to talk about that really quickly with your tables. What do you guys think the answer to that question is? What does regard mean? High regard, high respect. That is, it's honored by people. I mean, it is what society thinks. We all get caught into that. fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, 
and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. All right, so question. What does this passage teach us about marriage? Anyone have any ideas? That's okay. I have ideas. <laughs> All right. So the first thing that I really want to point out about this is that this is the very beginning of creation. So this is God's original design for sex, marriage, and childbearing. This is actually before the fall, too. So this is before sin enters the world. That means that this design, God's design for this, for the Sixth Commandment, was before the fall. Like, this was his perfect design. And so before sin enters, this marriage union, this covenant, was created. That's really beautiful and important. That's why marriage is something that is so sacred and so beautiful. So um, the important part is that God highly, highly values it, right? So the first thing is that God created male and female. He created them different yet complementary. What does complementary mean? They go together. They work together, okay? So the actual, like, the original language, actually, the word helper means opposite ally. Isn't that interesting? Opposite ally. So it means that females and males are opposite in that they're different. God created womanhood and manhood to look different, to be different. And yet they're supposed to be complementary. So it says the opposite ally. That's what that word helper means. Opposite ally. So we are supposed to be on the same team, united, moving together. Okay? So that's the nature of female and male. And that is how God created us in his image, male and female. Then two, marriage and sex was God's idea. Again, pre-fall. So he's the one that instituted it. And because he institutes it, he started it, he gets to define it. That's what's so important. And so he's created that, that act of sex to be within the confines, the protection of a marriage relationship. So we have Satan who likes to take what God values and diminish it. Okay? So God values all of those things very much. He values his children. And Satan wants to tell us it doesn't really matter. It's not that big of a deal. He wants to diminish it. But God says, no, this is one of the most important things. Because he did it right after he created us. Marriage involves a leaving, a joining, and a staying. So did you guys see that last verse? It says, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. What does that mean? One flesh. Can you go anywhere without your body? Like, if I ask you to leave your body in the room and go over to the commons, can you do that? Or the narthex, can you do that? Yes. You can't, unless you physically die, right? That's the only time our souls and our bodies will ever be separated. You can't go anywhere without your flesh. Your soul and your flesh are united. That's how united a husband and wife are called to be. They're called to become one flesh, and they become one flesh in the act of sex. So that's why it's a lie when society says you can have that act of sex outside of marriage and have no consequences. That is false. It's a lie from the devil. Because that, that act is meant to bond a husband and wife together for the rest of their life. So that is, that's why there's so many attachments. That's why there's so many feelings. That's why it's so painful when people um, live together and then separate. That's why there's so much pain and heartbreak in divorce. I know that there's a lot of people here that might have parents that have been divorced. And you probably know firsthand that divorce does create a level of pain. It's because that's not God's original design or intent. God wants 
husbands and wives to become one flesh for the mutual benefit and joy of each other. Okay, that was God's original plan before sin. And now God does allow for divorce in certain cases, but even that was not his original plan. Those things all involve sin and brokenness, right? So that's what we know about the, how marriage started. Now, Malachi 2, 13 through 16. You guys can feel free to turn there if you want to. If not, you can just wait for me to read it. And so when you take it outside of marriage, 
you literally create this, this powerful force that can create and wreak havoc on the rest of your life. And God warns us about sexual sin specifically because it is a sin to your own body. Paul actually warns us about that. He says that this sin, sexual sin, is something that's a little more personal than a lot of the other sins. And it can really wreak havoc on your relationship with God and your relationship with others. Um, a few other things I wanted to mention. Um, actually, let's just go. Let's just go for the questions now, and hopefully we can. Oh, this is the last part I wanted to say. Um, so this is uh, me and my husband, and we've been married for about five months now. Now, I want to tell you guys that uh, two years ago, if you would have asked me how dating was going, I would have said it was absolutely terrible <laughs> and awful, and I was sure that there were no godly guys left in my generation. But I did keep praying. I kept praying that God would give me a godly husband that actually loved God and wanted to do things God's way. And God did deliver, and it took a lot of patience. And it wasn't in my timing whatsoever, but it has been absolutely 100% worth it. So when I talk about the Sixth Commandment, and I talk about all these quote-unquote rules that God gives us for it, I want you to know that I really know that it is for your good that he gives us these rules and laws. I've been able to experience the blessings of it firsthand, even when I didn't think that was possible. It is out there, and God, God's way actually is the best way. None of us, I promise you, a lot of our adult leaders would say the same thing. No person gets through their entire life without breaking the Sixth Commandment. Because the Sixth Commandment includes lustful thoughts, and it includes your actions as well as your thoughts. So all of us have broken the Sixth Commandment in one way or another. But those breaking of the Sixth Commandment does lead to destruction. We know that sin ultimately leads to death. And so the better way, God's way, can lead to the blessings that he promises us. He says, be fruitful and multiply. It's the best way to have Christian families and Christian marriages that last your whole life. It's what you guys want for your future. It's what God wants for you, too. It's God's will for us. So we are going to be handing out, um, and I'm going to ask, Matt, if you can help me with this, too. Um, we're going to hand out some note cards and put some pencils on your table. And we're going to give you just a few seconds to write out your questions and put them back in the box. And then I'm going to answer... A few of them here tonight, and then we'll break into small groups after that.
try to answer some of them right now. that is unholy. 
where you are looking at something that incites lustful desire, okay? And pornography is treating people not like image bearers of God, okay? So whether you're in person or virtually you're lusting after someone, you are treating them as an object. You are not treating them as someone that is a whole person that has a spiritual, physical, emotional, social, physical side to them. You are not treating them as a daughter or a son of God. So the way I like to think about this, and this is also a rule that you can have for dating, right, is if, if God was watching that situation, would he be pleased? You can usually answer that question, okay? So, like, if you took a young lady on a date and you had her father go on the date with you, what would be appropriate behavior on that date? Okay? I want you to think about that because God sees everything. He knows everything. And that person that you were on that date with is a son or a daughter of God. Okay? Okay? So think about how God is going to protect and care for his daughters and his sons. Um, what is homosexuality? That is same-sex attraction. That is being attracted to the same sex. And what is sex? Sex is that act that is reserved for marriage. Um, what was is divorce okay? Divorce is not okay, and it is forbidden by God, except in the cases of an affair, which is adultery, which is sex outside of marriage. Uh, that is the breaking of those marriage vows by that other person. Dissertation, which is basically like a completely deserting that husband or wife. And then the third is abuse. So those are the three grounds for divorce. Besides that, God says divorce is not okay. So falling out of love with someone or not getting along, that is not biblical grounds for divorce. Can you describe a faithful marriage? That's a really good question. A faithful marriage is built on love. And that is defined by who? God. It says God is love. What did God do? God laid his life down for his church. So in marriage, there's going to be two people continually laying their life down for the other. Continually sacrificing for another. That is what love is, and that's what a faithful Christian marriage should look like. All right. Whew. Can you be a gay Christian? Here, drink water. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you be a gay Christian? So this one's tough because I think – so it would, it would require me sitting down with a person saying that they are a gay Christian because – you can believe in Jesus and still struggle with those same-sex attractions and absolutely be a Christian and a follower of Christ. The answer, 90% of the time, can you be a gay Christian, I believe is yes. The problem is that you need to be repentant of that. So if someone is struggling with that same-sex temptation and they realize this is not God's design for me, God designed us to be in a marriage relationship with a man and a woman. So I'm going to try to, you know, live a pure and chaste life. If they're struggling with that temptation, then they absolutely still can be Christian. It's like, it, I mean, I'm a Christian, and do I have struggles and temptation and sin in my life? Absolutely. 110%. But I also am repentant of the sin that I have in my life. I, every single Sunday I go to church, and when the pastor tells me to confess my sins, I have a whole laundry list. I know that I have sin in my life. And so I would say if this person also understands that they have sin in their life and repents of that sin, then they're just like me. It's the same thing. Their sin is not any worse than my sin. Their temptation is no worse than my temptation. So absolutely, there can be Christians that struggle with this because we all struggle with certain sins in our life. What is considered modesty? So I put modesty up there for a reason. How we dress, how we present ourselves is important. If we are presenting ourselves and clothing ourselves in a way that is meant to get the opposite sex um, attention, to make them think lustful thoughts, then that is wrong. Um, God calls us to modesty. 
And that doesn't necessarily mean like turtlenecks and long skirts, right? I know, I, I know. Turtlenecks. You love turtlenecks. <laughs> but the point is that there are certain parts of our body, and this goes for male and female, that are reserved for your spouse. So we shouldn't try to show off everything and to make other people think those lustful thoughts. Now, I will say, that is also, like, so it's a sin to purposely try to get other people to look lustfully at you, and it's also a sin to look lustfully at someone else. So you are not responsible for someone else's sin. Those are two separate things, okay? Um, why is cohabitation bad? Cohabitation is when a boyfriend and a girlfriend live together outside of the confines of marriage. This is against God's law for us because God says that when you're cohabitating, when you're living together, it is most likely that you are having sex, that that is happening. And it, if nothing else, even if that isn't happening, it's giving the image to other people around you that that is happening. And that is against God's law. God wants us to get married and only enjoy that kind of intimacy with a spouse, with a husband or a wife. And how it's perceived by others actually does matter because it does matter that uh, people think that we are or are not following God's word. We can't say we are a Christian and live in a way that looks completely contrary to what God says. It hurts our witness to other people. It hurts the way that we can show them who Jesus is. Okay, so that's why cohabitation is bad. Also, it increases your risk of divorce by 40%. So it also just doesn't make sense. Okay, so God, God's way actually is better. It's another example of how God's way is better. People that wait to, wait to move in together have a 40% more likelihood of staying married and staying together. So this idea that cohabitation is needed to see if it will work out is completely false. How long should you date to get married? Um, well, if it's you guys, a long time. No, kidding. <laughs> so how long should you date before you get married? Um, this is a subjective question, and I do think it matters um, how old you are. So if you are dating, you should be dating for the purpose of getting married. That is the entire purpose of the dating process. If you are not in the situation where you want to get married anytime soon, then you shouldn't be dating. What's the point? The point, what you're doing is you're actually just adding baggage for your future marriage, okay? So there's no point in getting into romantic relationships with people that you know are not going to be your spouse. There's just no point to it. All it's going to create is a bunch of the consequences I said earlier. It's gonna create things like heartbreak. It's going to attach you to people you aren't supposed to be attached to. It's going to potentially lead you into sexual sin. It's gonna do all these negative things because that person is has no chance of becoming your spouse. I do think this changes a little bit in high school. There are people that start dating in high school and get married, but you should date for the purpose of finding out if this person will or will not be your husband or your wife. That should be the goal of dating. There is no other reason to date. If you have another reason to date, if it's just fun for you, you're going to realize that that comes with more consequences than blessings. I know you guys all probably have friends that have already been heartbroken or trampled on or hurt by a romantic relationship that we all know is not going to necessarily lead to marriage, right? All right, is there any other good ones? Oh gosh, okay. Oh, I okay. All right. Whew, all right. <laughs> um, what happens after divorce? Um, so I don't know exactly where this question is heading. Um, what happens after divorce in a practical way or in a spiritual way? Um, I would say that anytime there is a divorce, it's a breaking of a covenant. And the covenant, a promise like that, is supposed to be eternal and it's supposed to be binding. So there is going to be pain involved with the divorce. There just is, because like I said, it wasn't God's original intention for something that's meant to be eternal to be cut short and to be temporary. Okay, so there's going to be a certain amount of pain after divorce, especially if you're talking about a family, right? And those children are going to be hurt by that divorce regardless of what you do. Now, there is a bunch of forgiveness and healing and redemption that are that's available for people that have been through divorce. It's just 
another thing that we need to heal from. Like God gives us, God gives us these amazing gifts of forgiveness, and He can redeem all situations for His glory and our good, right? So it all comes back to that. There's nothing that's beyond God's love, right? Nothing. Nothing we're talking about. No sin, cohabitation, homosexuality, LGBTQ, gender identity. None of those things are going to separate you from God's love. They're not. They can't. Because Jesus paid too high of a price for that to be able to separate you from him. Okay? So there is forgiveness and there is grace after divorce. How does divorce work? I'm curious. Um, okay, so. How long do you have? Yeah, yeah. Divorce in general is both a legal and a spiritual issue. Um, so divorce is just the separating of a husband and wife, and that can look a million and one different ways. It's impossible to summarize, but basically it's a husband and wife that choose to separate and to go on to live two separate lives, which is incredibly painful because they've been brought together into one flesh. So that tearing apart is a hard process. Um, can you have sex with one person and then another person after that? Um, so that's not God's intention. Uh, God's intention is that that is something that you save only for your spouse. And that is an amazing, amazing gift. That in your, on your wedding day, that you are able to say that your husband or your wife gets you completely. That that's something that you save for them. And so you don't go on to have another sexual partner for the rest of your life. But that is the only person for you for the rest of your life. That's the way that God intended it to be. Now, again, if that is not your story or if that doesn't end up being your story, there is forgiveness and there is grace. That's at the end of all of these sentences, right? There's forgiveness and grace for the brokenness. Because we have all messed this up and we will continue to probably mess it up. This world is definitely under attack in a lot of different ways, but especially with marriage and identity and sexuality and families. It's getting really ugly out there, which is why we have to look to God's word and see what did he originally design. And that's why I love the Genesis text, because it's so beautiful. That a man will leave his, hu uh, his father and mother and hold fast his wife for the rest of his life. And that they would build this life and have children together. It's the foundation of society. It's the foundation of the Christian church. It's how we were meant to be fruitful and multiply throughout the world. Okay, So that's God's amazing design for us. And again, it's what he wants for you. He doesn't want you to have hurt and brokenness and regret as part of your story. That's not what he wants for you. Okay, That's why these rules exist. The devil is going to tempt you to think that these rules mean that it's not as fun and you're not, um, you are, you're old fashioned and all these other things. But the truth is that this is what God wants for you and it will lead to better things for you and hopefully your future marriage and your future spouse. All right, so those were all of our questions and we have some time for small group left. So I'm gonna have you guys dismiss to small group and I'll see you guys later. Thanks.